Thanks for coming out on this cold night for this wonderfully interesting topic. A few remarks before we uh, get started. First is we have a new publication, which I hear is really good. I actually think it's very good, um, called Vital Interests, which is a deep dive into foreign policy issues. And it's not just headline foreign policy issues, it's also kind of foreign policy things you should know about. Everything from cybersecurity, to naval preparedness, to China, to the riots in Iraq, to what's going on in Venezuela. And um, it's been pretty successful. So you can find it on the Morning Brief. You can click on it there. You can go on the website. And I'd love your feedback in terms of anything uh, else. Um, second, Tuesday night, we have our final event of the semester. Same place, same time. Uh, Peter Bergen, his new book, Trump and His Generals. Um, and so you know, please feel free to come to that. Um, and um, I have a few final remarks when um, we leave. So let's get to today's event. Um, this is gonna be a really interesting conversation. Um, and don't get scared, but I just wanna tell you, there have been many reviews of Andy Greenberg's uh, new book, uh, uh, Sandworm, but there was one that sort of caught my imagination and I thought you should hear, and it began like this, it was in Forbes. Andy Greenberg's sandworm has achieved what I thought was no longer possible. It scared me. <laughs> now I just want to say, we're in the business of looking at things that scare people. That's part of what the whole national security thing is. And it's scary. And it's not just scary because of the act. It's of what happens. It's because of what it means about what happened, which I think is what you guys are gonna talk about tonight. So very briefly, you have their bios in front of you, but let me run through. Um, Andy um, is um, a senior writer at Wired. He's won a number of uh, journalism awards, one of them for a piece that predated this book that was on basically one of the things that the book is centrally about, NordPetya, um, attack, which you will know a lot about when you um, leave here. He's been a guest at the center several times, um, and I'm hoping we'll be back several times more. But the last time he was here, and this has something to do with why this topic is, one of the many reasons this topic is so interesting, was for a conference not on cybersecurity, not on cyber issues at all, not on technology, but on Ukraine. A year ago, we had a conference on Ukraine with a number of the people that you've now seen um, on your television uh, testifying. Um, and one of the focal points was the attack um, and the circumstances of what was happening in Ukraine that you're going to talk about um, today. And our moderator tonight will be Joseph Cox, who is a journalist covering cybersecurity, the digital underground, surveillance technology, um, and much more. He runs investigations in tech for Motherboard, which is part of Vice. Um, and I, I've, I've listened in on their conversation with the pretense of giving them ideas, but I really didn't do anything but you know, eavesdrop. And um, I think you're in for a wonderful conversation. So without further ado. Great. Yep, thank you all for coming. Um, I think we're gonna lay some groundwork first with, with Andy describing exactly who these sandworm hackers are. Um, and then we're going to get into the main campaign of Not Petcher, which is sort of a, a highlight of the book. Um, but of course, from that, we can talk about attribution, um, cyber insurance, the importance of attribution now. Not only are we increasingly seeing uh, successful attribution, but governments are increasingly calling out specific countries or specific groups as well. Um, and all of this comes up in the Sandworm book. So I guess just to start, very simple question, who exactly is Sandworm. Right, well, <clears throat> first I want to thank you, Karen Greenberg, no relation for having, I feel like I always have to say that. And thank, thank you, Joe, for, Joe is an amazing investigative reporter. It's an honor to be interviewed by him. Um, but Sandworm, well, let's see. So I've, I've covered cybersecurity and occasionally cyber war for about a dozen years. And um, for many of those years, stories about cyber war were these kind of hypothetical science fiction stories about like what, what would it be like if hackers caused a blackout, took down a power grid, um, if they destroyed all of the networks in every bank in a country, or if they uh, destroyed all the medical records inside of a hospital network. And now all of those things have actually happened. These stories are not hypotheticals anymore. And in fact, they have all happened at the hands of this one 
incredibly brazen hacker group called Sandworm. Uh, so I first started looking at Sandworm in late 2016 when my editors at Wired asked me to find the big story of cyber war. Um, and they had in their minds, I think, the, the election interference attacks by Russian hackers that year, the breach of the DNC and the uh, Clinton campaign. But I didn't see those uh, attacks as cyber war at all. That seemed to me just kind of like um, sort of espionage w mixed with dirty politics, yeah. the usual Russian stuff. And, and then getting a little bit messy with the sort of doxing of the DNC. And exactly. That sort of thing. But it wasn't cyber war. I mean, cyber war to me is um, a kind of cyber attack that breaks things, that mm. disrupts, that uh, shuts down critical infrastructure. Um, for, you know, and it's a nation state attack. Sometimes you could define it as being a nation state attack against another nation state in a time of war. These, in, in, the, in the midst of a physical war, these definitions all kind of vary. But by any definition, what was happening in Ukraine mm -hmm. seemed to be the real cyber war. Um, if you looked at Ukraine, and I had read this amazing piece that my colleague Kim Zetter, um, who then left Wired, she, but she had written this piece about the first blackout mm -hmm. caused by hackers ever, which had happened in Ukraine in 2015. And uh, the mechanics of that attack were so interesting when I started to look at them. The, the hackers had actually taken over the mouse movements of the operators in this control room in this Western Ukrainian electric utility. And these poor um, staff in this utility had to, had to watch. They were locked out of their computers and they watched as their own mouse movements clicked through circuit breakers, turning off the power to a quarter million Ukrainians. So I began to look at what was happening in Ukraine. I saw that, in fact, this blackout was just part of a, a big wave of attacks mm -hmm. um, that had hit every part of Ukrainian society, the government, the uh, media, private industry, and then the utilities and this kind of cl climax of that first wave. And then I started looking at who these hackers were that had performed that blackout attack and, and in fact were doing all of these attacks in Ukraine. And they had been discovered, it turned out, by this little company outside of DC called iSight Partners mm -hmm. in 2014, a year earlier. And iSight Partners did, had- Did they call it Sandworm at the time? Exactly, so iSight Partners had noticed uh, First, they, they, they thought that what Sandworm was, what these hackers were doing was espionage at first, because right. they were breaking into all kinds of- Which again of, is very normal. Right, that's sort of like state. the usual Russian yeah. stuff that yeah. seemed like they were um, spying on NATO targets, on Eastern European. But then it turned out that they had also breached American utility mm -hmm. targets as well. And they were planting this, this piece of malware and each of the samples of malware had a little snippet in it that was used to track the victims. And each one was a reference to the science fiction novel Dune, which is this you know, kind of classic science fiction book with these monsters and it's called sandworms that you know, occasionally rise up out of the desert and, and they're these giant monsters that do terribly destructive things. And, and then, so it was and then kind of, disappear again. Exactly, right. and, and, and so that was a kind of perfect name for this group. Um, so I said partners named them sandworm. I don't think they really knew how appropriate a name that would be. Right. Um, and the other thing that, that I said had found, or you know, was telling me, was that the same group that had turned off the lights for the first time ever, the first time ever that hackers had caused a blackout, that same group had also planted their malware in the American grid mm -hmm. a year before. So I could immediately see that this was not just, in fact, the first cyber war ever unfolding, but it was one that immediately had these kind of implications for American mm -hmm. national security too. This was a group that had um, laid the groundwork for an attack in the US. Mm -hmm. um, and as I was looking into this, they did it again. The same hackers caused a second blackout. This the time following in, year. In the capital right. of Kiev. Right. This was late 2016. So, so clearly there's something building there. Exactly, and, and um, I, you know, I had felt like maybe I was too late to this story. Mm. You know, it, was, it had been a year since that blackout. But now it was clear that this was an ongoing cyber war. In fact, it was escalating mm -hmm. in some ways. So uh, that's when I you know, kind of uh, began to track this group. I went to Ukraine. I kind of wanted to tell this story in like a, a new way by really capturing the experience of being um, in the midst of a cyber war. So I went to right. Ukraine to kind of talk to the people caught in the crossfire. And the well, because I mean, often we will cover these sort of cyber attacks, obviously from afar, because we physically live somewhere else. And but so will cybersecurity exactly. researchers. They'll well, we'll just look at the malware or something. People don't really talk to the Ukrainians who are actually in a blackout, apart That's from right. perhaps Ukrainian media, right? But 
I mean, there's, it turned out that there was this kind of, I mean, very unfortunate for Ukraine, but kind of wonderful for the rest of us situation where Ukraine was being used as a test lab mm -hmm. for cyber war. Russia had invaded Ukraine in 2014. Um, and that physical invasion had been accompanied with all these cyber attacks because Russia could just get away with whatever they wanted, it seemed, in Ukraine. They had been sanctioned for the physical war, but then they kind of had this freebie that they could do whatever else they wanted, and you know, it was all in the same package. You know? mm -hmm. So uh, Russia was, not only was Ukraine experiencing these unprecedented attacks of all different kinds, but they also really wanted to talk about it uh, because they were sick of the West just ignoring what Russia had done to them really for centuries, but uh, now in this kind of new era, um, these sort of unprecedented cyber attacks. So when I went to Ukraine, I found that the victims of these attacks opened up like no other victims of cyber attacks mm -hmm. I've ever tried to interview. Mm -hmm. And I talked to you know people in that Western Ukrainian utility who would just, one of them had like films with his iPhone, his mouse being taken over, and he just airdropped me the, um, the video to my phone. And uh, another guy who had been this sort of incident responder described to me how he <clears throat> tracked these hackers. He had tracked them for a year until <clears throat> finally in that second blackout, uh, they had turned out the power to his home. And he knew immediately that this was the same hackers that he'd been tracking, Sandworm. And he felt this in a very personal way that uh, the sort of technical research he'd been doing had reached out into his home. Um, it was, you know, so th these were the experiences of the Ukrainians. And I tried to capture them in this big cover story I did for Wired. Mm -hmm. But the theme of that story, the kind of thesis, was that what, what was happening to Ukraine was a kind of experimentation, that Russia was building cyber war capabilities, and that they would not confine them to Ukraine, that what happened in Ukraine sooner or later would happen to the rest of us too. And I, get, and I remember, of course, that was the, the big piece in Wired, as you say, talking about these attacks. And then, of course, we'll get to NotPetya shortly, which she also did a piece about. But at this point in time, when you've done the blackout piece, and you've been to Ukraine uh, the first time, right? Mm -hmm. Did you know or think, well, this is going to be a book? Oh, absolutely not. Yeah, I, I you, in you fact. Thought that you thought that was it, sort of? I, I sort of, like, um, I had sort of, I was sort of of two minds about this, this thesis that what happened to Ukraine would soon spread to the rest of the world. Mm. Um, because you, could you might be wrong, and it might be really embarrassing. Well, well also, um, that's true, but also, like, <laughs> it, it reminded me of those bad cyber war stories of the past. Like, what if, you right. know, when will it happen here? Well, we, and we've of, had that hype for years and years and yes, years, right? Exactly. Before that Ukraine right. stuff, we would have regular stories of, oh, there's some port scanning of a utility or something, exactly. and a lot yeah. of journalists would go crazy over it. But here was, as you say, right. a real concrete case of it. Yeah, exactly. But there was sort of a precedent for it because Russia had hacked the Ukrainian election in right. 2014 as well. They tried to spoof the results of that election, um, the first one after the revolution uh, in Ukraine. And then they had hacked the American election, more or mm -hmm. less. So you could see this kind of syllogism, like they hacked the Ukrainian election, then they hacked the US election. They hacked the Ukrainian power grid. Are they going to hack our power grid at some point? Mm -hmm. um, so there was sort of like um, the logic was there. But I was a little bit, you know, uncertain about making a, pr a predictive story like that. But uh, by bizarre, I don't know, this is just a very strange coincidence. The, the, the week that that story came out, the, in fact, the Ukraine one, yeah. The day, yes, that this like yeah. Ukraine cover, cyber war cover story hit newsstands was the day that this piece of malware, not Petya, yeah. began to spread around the world. Right. Hit Ukraine and then immediately spread to everywhere. And that prediction uh, came true, in, you know, m not in the way that I expected, but in this very immediate sense. Well, before we go into yeah. the specifics of Not Petya, what exactly happened that day? So what, what, what right. was this malware? Well, <clears throat> Not Petya, at first, and I'm sure you covered it too, mm -hmm. um, looked like a ransomware worm. So ransomware, as you guys probably know, is, some, is a piece of malicious software that encrypts your files or your whole computer and then holds a ransom. You're, it shows you a message that says pay, in this case, 300 bitcoins and will decrypt your files and not until you pay the ransom. Um, it turned out, uh, well, this was, I should say, a worm, a ransomware worm. So it wasn't just one computer targeted by this, but it's, it spread automatically using a whole collection of tools, one of which was stolen from the NSA, another of which was a kind of open source password stealing tool, but it spread incredibly quickly. Immediately, uh, 
spread to 300 Ukrainian companies, uh, 22 banks, at least four hospitals in Kiev alone, multiple airports, every government agency in Ukraine, and every one of these networks that it touched, it just saturated every computer, shut them down, completely devastated each of these institutions. And it turned out very quickly that um, people could not pay the ransom. You paid the ransom, if you, you, if you paid the ransom, your files would not be decrypted. Mm -hmm. That was just a thin cover story. This was a destructive worm pretending to be ransomware. Mm -hmm. And worms uh, on the internet do not respect national borders. Right, so even though Ukraine was the target, it yeah. didn't obviously stop We think stop it was the target. Right. right. We think it was probably, it was certainly the primary target. Mm -hmm. um, but within hours, Natatya had spread to, well, really the whole world. It had, uh, it had hit Maersk, the world's largest shipping firm. It had hit Merck, the New Jersey pharmaceutical company, FedEx, Mondelez, the food company that owns Nabisco and Cadbury, um, really countless targets. It ultimately um, would shut down the medical record systems as well of hospitals across the United States. Uh, and, but for each of those companies, I should say, those are public companies. So we began to see them report their damages to shareholders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And each one was, was facing hundreds of millions of dollars in damage. But I mean, beyond the financial stuff, which, as you say, we found out later, right. all of those, well, a lot of those companies you just listed, like FedEx or Maersk, whatever, these are rather ironically companies that rely very much on the physical world, right? They are logistics firms. How did, right. how, how did this, what is in essence, of course, a cyber attack, how did that translate into impact sort of in the physical world? Well, so I, you know, so when, when that hit, I went to Ukraine and I quickly right. like, did a kind of whole, I, I knew Ukrainians would speak about this. Right. And I did a kind of quick oral history of, of like not, uh, the uh, Ukrainian experience of this worst ever in history cyber attack. Mm -hmm. um, and they, Ukrainians were very willing to share the, their experiences as, as I expected. But none of those companies wanted to talk about it, right. which I'm sure you've experienced. Like mm -hmm. uh, victims of cyber attacks, you know, often don't want to talk, but especially companies, they mm -hmm. don't want to be, they want to be victim shamed, mm -hmm. essentially. And so I had to spend you know, months uh, doing kind of, well, I don't know, actual investigative reporting where I was trying to find uh, anonymous sources inside of any one of these massive multinationals. Like in the instant response, or I mean, obviously I'm not asking you to be super specific, but in the companies or around the companies? Or um, I was trying, I, I don't know, eventually I, I should say, I, well, I, at first I thought like I would, at one point I thought that the story that I would get would be about Merck and I right. had some sources inside of Merck and they all chickened out. Mm -hmm. And then I started over and I had to rebuild like a whole uh, collection of sources inside and formally at Maersk, the mm -hmm. world's largest shipping firm. Mm -hmm. And ultimately that was where I succeeded at uh, reconstructing it, like pulling together the full story of the experience of one of these massive companies hit by NotPetya. Mm -hmm. And Maersk turned out to be, in some ways, the kind of perfect victim to illustrate what you were saying, that, like mm -hmm. this fact that, you know, this was not just an IT problem. Right. Like, uh, um, it, it looks that way at first. The, when I finally could tell this story, what it looked like was uh, one IT administrator described to me how he was working on this afternoon of June 27, 2017, the day of NotPetya, and he saw his screen go black in the Copenhagen headquarters of Maersk. Mm -hmm. And then he looked up to like see if anybody else was having a problem and he watched a wave of black screens go across the room, just black, 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 as every computer in the headquarters was encrypted. And then they began to show these ransom messages. But <clears throat> you know, soon the people are like running down the hallways, screaming to each other to turn off their computers as quickly as possible to try to save them from this worm. They, they were jumping over the physical turnstiles between parts of the building because um, even though security systems have been broken, paralyzed, and you know, unplugging computers in the middle of meetings. Uh, but then, as you, know, as you were getting at, Maersk runs a fifth of the world's global shipping capacity. They have 76 ports, ter terminals in ports around the world. Like um, the one in Newark, for instance, is a pretty typical one. It's uh, a full square mile where ships the size of the Empire State Building are arriving all the time carrying tens of thousands of containers uh, 
And in, in, on this day, uh, those ships were arriving and nobody knew what was on them because Maersk's inventory system had been wiped. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, the gates to 17 out of 76 of these terminals were also paralyzed. So tens of thousands of 18-wheeler trucks carrying shipping containers trying to pick up or drop something off are just lining up outside of these 17 terminals. Um, Maersk can't even send an email to the truck drivers or the freight forwarders or the owners of the cargo or anyone. Um, that's how badly the network had been destroyed, essentially. Mm -hmm. And this was happening at, you know, from Los Angeles to Newark to Spain and the Netherlands and Mumbai. Like this, the scale of this is really hard to get your mind around. Right. And that is just the experience of Maersk. Like, uh, Maersk lost $300 million to this attack. FedEx lost $400 million. Uh, Merck ultimately lost $870 million, um, which you know, alone would be staggering. But you add these things up. I mean, Merck, I should say, also had their ability to, ability to manufacture vaccines mm -hmm. broken by this. They had to borrow their own HPV vaccine from the Center for Disease Control because their, their actual manufacturing was disrupted. Um, and each one of these companies has a story like that. And we don't even know the full extents of, of uh, how many private companies felt these kinds of pains because they don't have because to they don't, they talk don't to their shareholders. Right. Holders, right? right. Um, but ultimately, we do know the White House um, ultimately assessed the total global damages of NotPetya as at least $10 billion, mm -hmm. which is um, significantly more than anything we'd ever seen before. Right. Um, and I guess probably the, the last thing on NotPetya would be we've had the financial damage and then we've had some of the um, logistical impact. Um, what was the impact on these um, American hospitals right. you, you mentioned? Because another one of these um, hyped up situations as well as hacking the power grid, which eventually obviously turned out to be true, is that we're gonna have some sort of cyber attack that leads to physical harm. And we had that with WannaCry, or oh, sorry, we had the, we had people talking about that with WannaCry before NotPetya, which targeted hospitals. Right. What was the impact on the American hospitals here? Right, as you say, I think everyone in the cybersecurity, on the cybersecurity beat, like us, has been sort of waiting, dreading, or depending on your kind of, um, if it bleeds, it leads mm -hmm. mentality, waiting for the first cyber attack that actually kills someone, mm -hmm. which seems inevitable. I don't think we've necessarily had it confirmed. Yeah, maybe. No, no. Yeah, um, I, I don't uh, think so, yeah. But, but anyway, uh, Natatya did, Natatya may have been that attack. Right. You know, we don't know. Um, so a couple of American hospitals, so I should, I should say first, by the way, like the way that Natatya was initially seeded out to all of its victims was through this piece of Ukrainian accounting software. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the Sandworm, these Russian hackers, took over that the server behind that accounting software and hijacked its software updates and used it to seed out this worm so that essentially everyone doing business in Ukraine, all Ukrainian companies, but also pretty much everybody doing business or filing taxes in Ukraine, where their networks mm -hmm. were infected. And all it took was one little foothold and the worm would spread within your network. M um, Maersk, for instance, had like one computer in their Odessa office on the Black Sea coast of Ukraine uh, that, had, that was running this accounting software, and that was enough for the mm. entire global network to be taken down. Um, it turns out that this little company, it's not little, a, a, a mid-sized company called Nuance also did business in Ukraine, had a Ukrainian office. Nuance makes speech-to-text software. Mm. Um, and it turns out that a big part of Nuance's business is that they provide that software to hospitals uh, across the US. Nuance lost $100 million themselves to NotPetya. They were terribly hit. But the real important effect of this was that uh, hospitals across the US uh, began to see within 24 hours that their doctors, this was a kind of silent failure. They didn't realize at first was that this was happening. But their doctors were reading changes into Nuance's software, changes to medical records that were meant to be transcribed, mm. automatically transcribed into patients' records. But because of this silent failure of Nuance, all those changes were being lost. Right. So within 24 hours, I, I talked to like one um, chief information security officer at a, at a network of 24 hospitals. And she described how 24 hours later, they had a backlog of more than a million changes to medical records 
they just did, you know had just vanished. Mm -hmm. they, they had just gone in nowhere. Um, and I spoke to another IT administrator at a major American hospital who described what that meant on the ground, which was that you know, a few days after Natatya, a, a nurse ran up to her and said, we have a child patient who needs to be transferred for uh, a procedure at another hospital. And we don't know if this patient, this child, has had their requisite tests right. because they're missing from the records. Um, so we have to, we can't do that procedure until we do. And, they, and this IT administrator had to hunt through all of the untranscribed raw audio files that the hospital had collected to find the right one, make that transcription at the last minute. They managed to do it with hours, you know, just hours to spare. And they got the child's um, procedure done. But then this happened three more times within just a week mm -hmm. uh, that they caught these missing changes to medical records at the last minute before some important, you know, critical uh, medical procedure. And that IT administrator was, was haunted by this because she felt like she had, in fact, caught her, you know, she had protected her patients mm -hmm. from harm. But then the scale of this, uh, this happened at, at least dozens of American hospitals, right. likely hundreds. And each of them has hundreds or thousands of patients. It's very difficult for anyone to say that all of those missing changes were caught in time. Right. That nobody suffered some sort of harm to their health or their life as a result of this. And it does, I think, capture the kind of third order effects of a cyber attack like this and just how insanely reckless it was mm -hmm. of Sandworms to have done this. I mean, with all those impacts and effects, uh, bearing those in mind, um, and as you say, it appears that Ukraine was the main target, do you think Sandworm meant or meant to infect places in the United States? Or? Well, the other fact that I didn't mention just now is that Russian companies uh, were terribly hit by NotPetya too. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if they were hit to the same degree as Maersk and Merck and FedEx, but they were badly hit. And uh, that, that, that does seem like an accident. Right? Like, um, because ordinarily they wouldn't. It doesn't seem like the Russian government would willingly, would purposefully, they may be they may have done it willingly. They may have been willing to sacrifice their own private sector's you know, security to do this. But uh, it seems more likely that everything outside of Ukraine was just collateral damage by mm -hmm. a group of you know, insanely macho and reckless hackers who just didn't really care to try to limit the blast radius of their attack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess <clears throat> we should probably just clarify before cl closing that bit off. When it does come to someone and who they are, what? Um, what section of the Russian government are we actually talking about? Right, so in the, you know, after, in the book is sort of told in three acts, and the first act is kind of like about these, this cyber war building in Ukraine and the predictions that um, it's going to spill out to the rest of the world that are totally ignored and not heeded. The second act of the book is sort of about this disaster story of what happens when that cyber war really did spill out and the damage that it did. And the third act is kind of like, uh, trying to get to the bottom of who Sandworm really is mm -hmm. and hunting them down as best as, I wouldn't say I can, but you know, as the security community, the security researchers who are my sources and characters could. Um, and through their amazing forensic work, eventually it's, it's revealed and confirmed by the, U, by the US government and the UK government that Sandworm is essentially the GRU. They're, they're a part of the GRU the Russian military intelligence agency mm -hmm. that happens to also be responsible for all, all kinds of other terrible things like the election interference, mm -hmm. for instance, and the attempted assassination of Sergei Skripal and the downing of uh, a Malaysian airliner over Ukraine, killing mm -hmm. 300 civilians. They are just the, the source of so much chaos mm -hmm. in the world, but particularly in the orbit of Ukraine. I mean, you mentioned that um, the US government linked the attack to um, the GRU. With that in mind, there is another cyber attack um, that, as you pointed out, I think in the Washington Post op-ed yeah. about Olympic destroyer. That's an instance where it most likely was um, the same unit, right? right? But there hasn't been a public declaration from the US government about that attack. Yeah, yeah. Before talking about the, speci uh, the specifics of that, just talk about how important is it that the US government came out and said, yes, NotPetya was 
GRU? And maybe yeah. even just generally speaking, like why, why even do that? You know, they, don't, well, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have to do that necessarily. It, I think it's even more important how long it took them to do it, mm -hmm. how long they didn't ever say anything about sandworm, how long the whole, the entire Western community, including the US government, um, failed to call out the fact that Russia was carrying out these cyber war attacks in Ukraine. The kind of like quintessential acts of cyber war that we've been fearing um, and kind of warning people not to do for decades, like turning off the power to civilians. When it happened, the US government said nothing mm -hmm. because it was kind of considered to be Ukraine's problem, uh, which was a terrible mistake mm -hmm. uh, in terms of trying to set those red lines, norms for cyberspace. Uh, but eventually, you know, after it was already too late, after this cyber war had in fact spread to the US, um, even then it took eight months after not such a hit. And uh, I, for those eight months, I thought I was going insane. You may have also felt that mm -hmm. way. Like, why is nobody saying this is Russia? Because mm -hmm. in fact. And, and this is after, I think it's after the, the US government said that North Korea did the Sony one, for instance. Right. I mean, so they, it was building. This was becoming yes. a trend where there would be public attribution. Right. I mean, right. the Obama administration had been very proactive about this, had called out uh, North Korean hackers, mm -hmm. Iranian hackers. And Chinese indictments. And right, had tried to make these rules. Mm -hmm. um, but the Obama administration failed, too. The, that first blackout attack happened on the Obama administration's watch, and they said nothing, mm -hmm. which is kind of remarkable. Um, but anyway, the, the, the second one happened, um, and it was Trump's problem. And of course, I mean, it's, it's more predictable that Trump would do nothing. But then finally, this attack did spill out hit American soil, Merck is an American company, lost nearly a billion dollars to this attack. Uh, but anyway, so even then it took eight months for the White House to finally put out this statement, which was like two paragraphs long, that just said simply, uh, this attack was the work of the Russian military. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, I, I, I have a, you know, that it kind of suspiciously, that statement was accompanied by other statements from the UK, mm. Canada, Australia, New Zealand. So you kind of get the sense that Maybe the uh, the, American, the U.S. White House was kind of dragged along with this, but By the five I, eyes, I can't yeah. really right. um, confirm that. By the other five English-speaking mm -hmm. governments, um, all calling out Russia together. Mm -hmm. um, so that, but that was nonetheless an important moment. That was the first time, after two and a half years of Sandworm carrying out these terrible attacks on critical infrastructure and civilians, that they were finally, essentially named and shamed. Mm -hmm. No one said Sandworm. Um, no one even said the GRU initially, mm -hmm. but it was the first time that U uh, the, the U.S. intelligence community named Russia as the source of all these attacks and yeah. said that there would be consequences. And in fact, a month later, there were new sanctions. Right. Um, but I, I continue to believe that that was too little and far too late uh, in terms of trying to create this kind of cyber peace we've been sort of like noodling on in think tanks for so many years, we've lost the chance to, to kind of make those rules when we had the opportunity. Right, and I mean, maybe rather than asking, because okay, you've already answered it, why it's so important to call out, when it came to the case of Olympic Destroyer, which was a hacking campaign um, against the Winter Olympics, right? Right, so I should just kind of like tell yeah, that yeah, story yeah. in case people didn't. But then uh, I would just say, yeah. uh, uh, after you've given the background on that, yeah. why does it matter that governments haven't publicly attributed that, I see. that yeah. attack? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so maybe the third big, uh, well, the biggest attack in kind, of, kind of in the third act of the book um, is this mysterious attack that hits the 2018 Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang. And uh, this was a kind of sort of mini Nagpetya. It was another destructive worm, but it hit just <clears throat> <clears throat> the, main, the main victim of this was the um, Pyeongchang Organizing Committee the entire IT back end of the Winter Olympics was destroyed by a worm. And it hit in this kind of really cruel timing at the exact moment that the opening ceremony uh, of the Olympics began on February 9th, 2018. Um, and the poor IT administrators for the Olympics had to run out in the middle of the opening ceremony and drive to their um, data center and spend the next 12 hours just desperately working to, to isolate and wipe to delete this worm that was just repeatedly taking down all of their servers, the Wi-Fi, 
the app, the ticketing systems, everything would have been broken. Um, but they did succeed at rebuilding the entire network in those 12 hours so that when the games began at 8 a.m. the next day, uh, everything was, was working, which is kind of a miracle. Um, but this attack immediately got even more, got stranger because uh, it, it had some of these sort of sandworm-like Russian fingerprints, but it also had Chinese-looking fingerprints, mm -hmm. snippet, you know, pieces of code that matched Chinese hackers, known Chinese state hacking groups, and North Korean hackers. Uh, so it was this kind of strange whodunit where um, whoever had done this had sewn in all of these false flags, not just one, but in fact a whole collection of them in layers to, to fool the whole security community. Um, I'll go ahead and spoil the ending. You can imagine <clears throat> who actually did this. It was the GRU, it was Sandworm, in mm -hmm. fact. Um, and, but it shows the, the ways that not only have their kind of uh, disruptive techniques been evolving, but so have their deceptive abilities. Mm -hmm. It took uh, two weeks for, until the, in this case, the Washington Post was, had some anonymous sources mm -hmm. that revealed that, um, well, that the CIA believed that Olympic Destroyer was the work of the GRU, mm -hmm. that it was made, to, it was, was meant to frame North Korea. Mm -hmm. But we didn't see the evidence of that, in fact, for years. And uh, the really remarkable thing that you're getting at is that uh, we still haven't seen an official statement from any government, but certainly not the US government, saying that Russia carried out this act of cyber sabotage against the Pyeongchang Olympics, mm -hmm. and, uh, or you know, trying to hold them accountable, scolding them, even in the slightest, not to mention trying to like, indict the hackers who did it, or new sanctions, or we haven't even said that Russia did this right. uh, publicly, officially, which really just invites them to do it again. Uh, which they seem likely to do now that they have been banned from another Olympics, right? right? Yeah. So, I mean, what do, uh, what do you think is going to happen for the, the following Olympics? Do you think it's yeah. pretty likely that we're going to see it's, something? Or? I, you know, I, I hate to make predictions because, sure. like, these are the these guys by their very nature are just extremely unpredictable. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you know, it seems like why would they not? We we have in fact already seen that the GRU they, had, they kind of had like you know there there are two big notorious hacking teams within the GRU, one known as APT28, uh, who did do the kind of hacking and leaking operations more often. The more um, audacious, bombastic, aggressive yeah, sort I mean, of stuff? Well, I wouldn't say it's more aggressive because Sandworm is the one who's actually right. destroying things and you know, um, causing like mass disruption of civilian infrastructure. But they are doing like louder things mm. in a way they're, they, they um, steal information and then leak it in this very sensational way. And they did that to the World Anti-Doping Agency mm -hmm. before the last Olympics um, to try to try to basically try to discredit the Even Olympic. taking on the name that security researchers have given them, yeah. Fancy Bear, right, they and just making their own website for that. Website, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they were, we've already seen evidence that they're starting to do that again mm -hmm. for the 2020 Olympics. So it seems you know the pattern then was doing these hacking and leaking operations and then kind of cl climaxing in the, the actual act of sabotage against the Olympics in the moments of the games. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing the first steps of that play out again. I mean, it would be, it would be, it would be silly to discount the, these like, obvious signs that that could happen again. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sandworm is still out there. They haven't done any big attacks for a little while now. They could very well be planning to show something off mm -hmm. in Tokyo in 2020. Mm -hmm. Um, there's sort of one area I wanted to touch on last before we open it up to any questions. Um, when it comes to attribution, and this isn't about why it matters so much, but you'll have President Trump and then various other Republicans saying, well, we don't know who hacked the DNC, or, well, maybe it was Ukraine, even though there is robust, incredibly strong technical evidence to show that it was this particular Russian unit, whether that's, you know, same IP addresses and the malware and that sort of thing. Um, nevertheless, in this age of let's just discredit, it's fake news, whatever, they will still say, um, well, we can't possibly know. What is your response to people? And it's not necessarily politicians. We have this in the um, security research community as well and some journalists. What do you say to the people who say, well, attribution isn't possible? which was very fashionable 
in like our community a couple of years ago, and I think it's kind of changed now. Yeah, well, <clears throat> it's clearly possible. In fact, there have been very few, I can think of, I'm sure you can think of some exceptions, but very few major cyber attacks that have not ultimately been attributed by intelligence agencies. Like uh, The only one I would say is the dumping of the exploits by Shadow Brokers. So Shadow Brokers is this weird exception. That we don't really that, know. Like this big mystery, these hackers you know, broke into the NSA, stole a lot of their hacking tools and dumped them online. We still don't know who they are, which is insane. Um, but for the most part, the, the Western intelligence agencies, the five eyes, as you said, these English speaking governments, they usually get to the bottom of this and um, they can do that because they have tools at their disposal that I don't have. And most of my kind of day-to-day -day sources um, don't have either. I, I spend a lot of time talking to private intelligence companies who are some of the main uh, characters in this book. But the actual NSA and GCHQ and all those folks can hack the hackers and they have human spies inside of their buildings, you know, watching over their shoulders. I mean, they have resources to do this kind of attribution. Um, I mean, they can literally see whose hand is on the keyboard, which right, was the case, I think the Dutch. Right, so there's them. another Russian group, maybe part of the SVR, not mm. the GRU, who were, the Dutch eventually revealed that they had hacked their security cameras in their building and were you know, watching them at work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, intelligence, US and Western intelligence has amazing tools to do attribution. So absolutely, it's possible. Is it possible for the private sector? I mean, that's, the, that's a harder question. Um, it seems like the private sector, the security research community, all of these security companies that sort of like, um, I talk to all the time, you probably talk to a lot, they will put out evidence um, mm -hmm. for, that ties together cyber attacks that shows that Sandworm did this and that Sandworm also did this and this. But then we do kind of depend on intelligence agencies many times to say, um, and all of that collection of activity is the GRU and they're in this building mm -hmm. and it's these guys. And, but with a combination of those two things, because the intelligence agencies don't show their work, they don't put out the evidence, but with those things combined, you really can build a kind of forensic web to tie a lot of the activity to you know, names and faces and addresses, which is what I, you know, what I ultimately do in this book. Mm -hmm. So I, um, attribution absolutely is hard. It's getting harder as people like Sandworm build false flags into their attacks. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's possible and it's entirely necessary. The, you know. But elaborate on that, what right. last point, just why is that <clears throat> necessary? I wonder if it's even necessary to explain that to like a normal, sure. you know, or national security audience especially, but um, the cybersecurity industry mm -hmm. has this strange like counterintuitive idea, I think, that you don't need to do attribution, mm. that like it doesn't really matter if it's North Korea or China that's hacking you, just protect yourself. Right. Um, but I think that that's, that may be true if you're- If you you're know, a defender. If you're a defender. Yeah. But for us, we people who think about geopolitics, who think about diplomacy, trying to hold bad actors accountable, of course it's, it's, it's like so obvious that we need to do this work of attribution and that the intelligence agencies need to get on their game in terms of uh, not just coming out with an answer eight months later, or some, in some cases just kind of whispering about it in Fort Meade. I mean, they need to, uh, to try to affect public opinion, to, to, you know, within days of an attack, like the attacks on the 2016 elec US election, come out with you know, press conferences, convincing public scraps of evidence, at least, to show, to convince the public mm -hmm. that this was Russia that did this. And they failed to do that too in 2016. And that allowed uh, these silly, like very basic um, cover stories like Guccifer 2.0, mm -hmm. uh, and poor Seth Rich, you know, yep. these kinds of people to be used as very uh, thin cover stories, but they worked on half of the American population. So uh, I think that there is a lesson here about the whole cybersecurity community, including the kind of, um, you know, these sort of elite hackers in Fort Meade, in the NSA and GCHQ, needing to be more public about attribution. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we'll open it up to questions. Do we have Thank microphones you. or? Okay. Um, can we have at the front here? 
Hi, uh, my name is Tintin Japarides. I am from Columbia University along with my friends. So this is a fascinating conversation and also Andy, I've been following your work for years and oh, I absolutely love and admire what you do. So thank you very much for being here. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is on the Olympics. I find it fascinating, I'm from Georgia myself, that Russia has been using the Olympics, um, that timing for its attacks, be it 2008 Georgia, 2014 when the Ukraine, Ukraine crisis started, and then obviously 2018 that you just talked about. I wonder if there's a reason for that parallel or if it's just a coincidence, which I You're doubt. From, like Atlanta, kind of Georgia, Atl right? Not the other. Georgia, the country, Georgia, former the country. Soviet, oh, I yes. See. Because there were cyber attacks on the Atlanta Olympics, I believe, as well. Um, sorry, yes, I wasn't sure what you, but which Georgia you meant. 2008, yeah. uh, right, of course, also China. Those. Oh, okay. That yeah. Olympic. So to 2008 in China, the Summer Olympics, and then the, the war in Georgia kicked off. Um, and obviously there were cyber attacks too, not as sophisticated as what Russia did in Ukraine, but still. But definitely a, a precursor to the kind of cyber Absolutely. war we would see. Yeah. Absolutely. So I was wondering about you know, your take on if this is just a mere coincidence, and if so, why would they use the Olympics? Um, that timing. And then my second question is more on cybersecurity education. So as the malicious actors become more and more sophisticated and aggressive toward not only looking for vulnerabilities, but also defenses. How can societies as a whole on a global scale and at a grassroots level try to protect themselves um, to be less vulnerable to these aggressive attacks? Thank yeah. you. <clears throat> well, I, I actually had not really thought about the connection between the 2008 Olympics and the Georgian cyber war, if you can call it that, which was barely a cyber war. I mean, Georgia, there was like 8% internet penetration in Georgia, and so all of these cyber attacks sort of were almost just like a kind of test, I think, um, at the time. Um, the, I, I, I'm not sure that the pattern that I can observe goes back that far, but in recent Olympics, you can just see that there's a kind of, I don't know, sour grapes uh, motivation, it seems like. I mean, it's so petty, it's kind of hard to believe that that is the extent of it. Um, it's a bizarre thing to have well, been banned from the Olympics and then to, to kind of have this attitude, well, if, if we can't enjoy the Olympics, no one will. And then to attack them with a cyber attack that can't even be attributed to Russia. So it's not sending a message. Uh, it wasn't meant to be attributed to Russia, I don't, I don't believe. Um, or, you know, it's, it's hard to say, but it had all these false flags in it. Um, so, you know, uh, some cybersecurity researchers, I think Wiley Newmark at uh, Dragos is starting to talk about vanity cyber attacks, which is, I think, a really interesting way of putting it, um, that Russia didn't really gain anything from this, but somebody in the GRU impressed his boss that day, and uh, his boss's boss, and maybe Putin likes this kind of thing. It's, it seems like the kind of, I hate to stereotype um, the sort of Russian military machismo, but that seems like what it is. It's like, well, if, if we can't just sit by and watch this events that we've been banned from unfold. We just need for our own satisfaction to try to spoil it. Um, that, that seems like what happened in uh, 2018 and what they're potentially preparing to do again. Sorry, and then the question, the second question was uh, um, how to defend. Cybersecurity education. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I hate to say this, but I feel like the notion of just defending ourselves from these sort of sophisticated attackers is, I mean, yes, we need to do that. We need to build um, our, our defenses and our resilience maybe is like a less obvious point. Like we need to be ready to um, recover quickly from cyber attacks because an actor as sophisticated as a sandworm, you can't really prevent them from getting in or maybe even doing their blackout attack, but maybe you can be prepared to, you can, you know, uh, do, you can have a kind of analog fallback, you can have like, um, you, can, you can have done the, the trial runs to be prepared to recover quickly from those attacks. And DARPA is starting to work on that sort of thing, which is, I think, really important, that resilience. Um, but the big idea that I keep hammering on um, in, in the book is that um, the way to protect ourselves from this is to try to, is, is diplomacy, is to try to set norms to draw red lines. Um, it's certainly the thing that we've done the very worst job of, at, of all. We, you know, the U.S. government um, in this whole Ukrainian saga has been so remiss in failing to 
um, make the right rules. Like we, we finally, after two and a half years of, of Ukraine cyber war, finally mention it in February 15th, 2018, in that statement that we've talked about. Six days earlier is when the Olympic destroyer attack hits in Pyeongchang, and we have still haven't talked about that. The US government has still not mentioned that. So you know, that is like just, I, just kind of incomprehensible negligence. And I, I, you know, if nothing else, let's just start calling out bad actors and trying to hold them to account. Sure. Can we go here, and then we'll go here? Hi, my name is Sophia. Um, I'm a law student here at Fordham. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my question is a bit more like conceptually in terms of how the US conceptualizes cyber ops and how Russia conceptualizes it. Because it seems like with the GRU, they have much more synergy and not that much differentiation between the espionage or the cyber war with attacking critical infrastructure. And at the same time, I feel like you can see traditional markers of Russian tactics, such as scorched earth tactics or um, deceptive tactics. So to what extent is the US currently exposed if we're not necessarily meeting them where they're at, where I think you know, the US might be more siloed with our cyber operations? Yeah, I think the US is, <clears throat> is siloed. We, you know, the NSA and cyber command have pretty different um, missions. Uh, whereas the GRU, you know, the, you, so the, the, when it comes time to do some sort of disruptive attack, that's Cyber Command. Um, they, they, of course, seem to work hand in hand with the NSA, but they are a separate organization. And the GRU, as you say, does all of this. Um, they have different teams, but they seem to share infrastructure. They, they work much more closely. But I think more importantly, they just are less restricted in what they, um, what they are allowed to do and what they just, they do all the time. I mean, that's the thing, like the NSA uh, and Cyber Command in particular have all of the same capabilities as the GRU, but they have lawyers too who, you know, keep them in check to, uh, uh, and, and, you know, uh, even in this kind of um, defend forward um, mantra that, you know, Nakasone is, is talking about and John Bolton seems to be pushing um, those disruptive attacks were pretty targeted uh, and limited, like uh, one that destroyed the network of the Internet Research Agency or that uh, destroyed computers in an Iranian espionage unit. You know, um, That is not even remotely the same thing as that, that Sandworm has done again and again where they just destroy you know, entire networks of private companies just for, just for fun almost, it seems like, just to kind of have some kind of generic uh, um, terroristic effect or cause blackouts or release a destructive worm that spreads to the whole world. The, the, the difference is, seems to be restraint. You know, the, the GRU has none as far as I can tell. I would just say that the lack of restraint on some of the Russian teams is that you'll have it where CrowdStrike um, named um, that group as hacking into DNC within what, 28, 48 hours, the Goose for Two persona sprang up. Right. Like it was incredibly <laughs> agile. And it was agile, and but you, also so you clumsy. Can't, it was right, like, right. Um, it was, it and you was, may not be able to do that with lawyers, is what I mean. Oh, they can yeah, just go, well, be, yeah. let's make this now. Yeah. 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 Uh, there was this one, and then there were some questions here. We'll go up there next. Hi, thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, I'm, I'm Bernadette Cullen. I'm with the Graduate School of Literature, of course. Uh, my question is, and I'm jumping off now what you were saying. Uh, the last 45 minutes, it's all these destructive attacks and we know who did it. And my thinking is, and maybe jumping off what you were saying is, how much longer does the good guy keep getting punched down, put himself, pull himself together, come back up and wait for the next attack? In other words, why isn't, and I, I know there's legal ramification, the Constitution it's set, but I, I'm trying to understand why wouldn't you attack back to let Russia know we can do this to you if you don't stop doing it to us. It was like Obama saying on the election, don't fool in our election to the Russian, I think Putin he said it too. But you know, words only go so far. And it's almost like everyone is a sitting duck waiting for the next strike. Are the Olympics the next sitting duck waiting for the strike? So. What would it take to take offensive, pretend we're the GIU and go on the offensive? 
Well, we do go on, on the offensive. Sometimes, as I was saying, like this, that has kind of been um, a, new, a somewhat new phenomenon. We've seen from um, the, NSA, the new NSA director, Paul Nakastoni, that he has, um, or, or rather Cyber Command, has done some of those um, offensive attacks, very targeted. I, you know, I, I would be really interested, but not surprised if, if, uh, if Cyber Command did, ahead of the next Olympics, destroy some Russian hacking infrastructure. But I, I don't know if it's, the, if it's the right approach. If that would not lead to just more escalation, it seems like the, uh, the likely outcome of, of that is just that's, that feeds into the arms race. And now Russia, you know, now the GRU is, you know, has their pride wounded as well and they feel like they need to counterattack. I mean, it seems like the kind of uh, Putin-esque menta mentality is that every time there's a slight like this, you have to hit back yourself with twice the force. Uh, the, and, and they're often like imaginary slights, even like the Panama Papers, you know, were uh, considered, you know, a, uh, an attack on Putin that he had to revenge himself for. So I, I think it's a dangerous game to play to try to, to, to just enter into the fray and hit back. I do think that you know. You try to be. The, you can try to be the adult, though, and like um, make make rules and try to like stop the conflict and say like anyone who does this, it's a war crime, or um, you know anyone who does this is going to be sanctioned. And we, you know, we it does seem that that anyway. I'm not a I'm not a true um, Russia expert, but I it does I I am told that that Putin responds to his himself and his cronies having their their money seized and being sanctioned. So. Um, I think that that's maybe more effective. There was one up there. Um, do we have time for one more after that? And then here in the middle. <coughs> Hi. Uh, it, it, the, the larger scale attacks like a national power grid or the Olympics, uh, larger institutional ones, aren't they in some sense easier to address because there are technical and budgetary commitments or resources available and are the smaller ransomware attacks that now cover I, dozens of US cities, Atlanta being you know, a, a prime example, aren't those in some ways harder to address? Because I don't think there's a municipality in the United States that could get back online in 12 hours with a full scale attack like the one that hit the Olympics. And if that continues, that will bankrupt a lot of the sort of smaller institutional government agencies in the United States that aren't federal agencies. And is there any budgetary commitment to that? Is there a technical commitment to that? Is there a technical capacity or budgetary capacity to address the danger? Well, I think that I, I take your point. It's really interesting. We've talked about three different big attacks, the, basically the blackout attacks, and there were in fact two of them, um, and the Olympic destroyer attack. Each of those was almost like a um, a performance. They were terrible. They ruined um, the day or the month <clears throat> of some IT administrators and engineers who had to respond to them. They were unprecedented and you know important, um, but they didn't cause like mass disruption for civilians. Um, the blackout, the first blackout in Ukraine, lasted six hours before Ukrainian engineers just were able to drive out to all the to the distribution stations and turn the power back on. It was essentially just flipping the switches. Uh, the second one, well, I'll, I'll come back to it in a second, um, but th my, my point rather is that Natetia, on the other hand, uh, it turns out it was like a much, it was a much less innovative attack. It was m less sophisticated, but it, it was just so broad rather than deep, I suppose. And, it, and that turned out to be vastly, vastly more disruptive to actual people's lives. Just, I mean, um, instead of doing this kind of uh, very fancy hacking where you're reaching out into the physical world and messing with uh, circuit breakers and transmission stations, they just encrypted a bunch of computers. I mean, an enormous number of them, but that's much, much easier to do in a way. And I agree, it's, it's a, it is probably the most practical threat that we should worry about. You know, there have been, there's been some reporting that DHS is preparing for a kind of not petty style attack that might hit the, at the, time of the 2020 election. I don't know what, how you prepare for that, honestly. Like, uh, that just means trying to secure an entire internet. Like, how do you do that? Um, 
So it's, I don't know, it's, it's hard to budget for that or prepare for it, I don't know. But the, but the other thing I wanted to say is that in that second blackout attack, that attack only caused a one hour blackout, um, which sounds kind of deceptively trivial, but the scary thing about it was that the plan for that attack, that which kind of failed, it caused a blackout, but the real intention was to essentially turn off the power and then put to sleep these safety systems uh, so that when the operators scrambled to turn the power back on, they would cause a surge in electric equipment, possibly destroy lines or a transformer, uh, the, like an actual destruction of equipment in a uh, in part of a power grid. And that could, uh, that could easily have very real effects, like a blackout that lasts weeks or a month, you know, uh, so the, you know, I, I don't want to dismiss these blackouts as just demonstrations or something. We still very well might see a kind of, um, you know, that kind of cyber physical hacking, as you call it, that reaches out into physical equipment that has destructive effects, and that would be very scary. And then Pip. Hi, um, I'm a research associate of Professor Jason Healy at Columbia, uh, and I've researched some of the black energy attacks. I have a question under my other hat, though, which is as a lawyer. And when you talk about the need for attribution, a lot of standard insurance contracts have an act of warring exclusion. Yeah. And when NotPetya was specifically called out as a Russian attack, I can't remember whether it was Mesk or Merck, but they went to court against their insurer who refused to pay, Merck. citing the act of Merck exclusion. And Mondelez both and had Mondelez. this situation. Yeah. So when you when you talk about the need for for attribution, and you have this kind of uh, influence that goes through the business when they can't get money for remediation, do you have ideas for how you can fix that as well? Well. <clears throat> um, just to like make clear what what you're talking about, because it's a pre it's pretty it's a pretty like um, uh, thorny little issue. Uh, basically, the insurance like these these companies that were hit by NotPetya filed for insurance claims for all their damages, but we're told we we don't cover acts of war, and NotPetya was an act of war. So Merck and Mondelez both are fighting out this this lawsuits lawsuits in court to to for them to try to prove that it was not an act of war which I think is a losing battle because it was pretty clearly an act of war. It was, they were collateral damage in the Ukrainian war. Uh, but, you know, so, so that helps to explain my, you know, feeling of why aren't these companies talking about the fact that Russia did this to them? Because maybe they were trying to, their lawyers were saying, you can't say that because as soon as you say that Russia did this, then you've made it an act of war and then our insurance claim is rejected, which it was anyway. Um, but I, I think that that's like a, that's, Try, trying to pretend that it wasn't Russia is the very silly way to try to get your insurance claim filled. Uh, you, you, you can't argue with that fact. You, you probably should just get better insurance, like prepare for the fact that you could be uh, a cyber war victim in the future. Okay, so we're out of time. A couple of things. I should have said this at the beginning, but I know all of you get our morning brief in the morning, our morning news service, which I think is entering its 14th year. Um, but we also have a cyber brief that comes out once a week on Monday mornings, and it seems to me you guys are the guys that if you don't get it, will very much want it. It's along the lines of what bad is happening this week, I have to say, but every now and then there's some good news, some new program or new book that we want to read, something like that. Um, Jennifer Indig is with us. She's the editor of it, so if you want to know more about it, talk to her. Um, anyway, so I encourage you to uh, get it. Uh, my job at the end of these um, events is to come up with the good news. Yeah, so thank you, gentlemen, for making it so easy. Um, so. You know, the good news is what it often is when we're talking about a really dire topic, is that a lot, um, you need really smart people to think about it and to know about it. But the other good news here is that so many of the journalists today are so wrapped up in the political framework of, you know, so reactive right away, to, and they have to be, to what's going on every single day in our world, particularly our national security world. And I think this kind of, the need, if you want to know where we have a need for long-term investigative, long-form investigative journalism, 
you kind of nailed it. So here's what I want. I want you to come back in a year, both of you, and we'll just see, we'll do like a, a reassessment. This I'm, I'll, I'll interview Joe. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, that, that okay. sounds perfect yeah. to me. So um, meanwhile, you're going to sign some books, right? Of course. So please buy some books. He can sign some books. And um, we'll see you all Tuesday night for Peter Bergen. Thank you very much. Thank you.